So uh, he asked me about deficiencies in Tavers Science and where do we need to go. We actually saw a lot of that this morning in various and sundry forms, and everybody did a great job of covering it. Here are the disclosures. Um, and so uh, I, I put in a slide uh, real quickly that just emula emulating Samir, uh, an imitation, the greatest form of flattery. We talked about what's different, what's changed, and, and where are the deficiencies. Well, these are the places where there really probably aren't the deficiencies anymore. Learn, learn it from Samir, try to get our partners to adapt it. Uh, they haven't fully embraced it yet. But we went to one ProGlide closure, and what it does is he talked about it eliminates the narrowing of the artery, and if as long as you don't have bleeding or screw it up, everything else works. Um, I will tell you that if you've done a lot of ProGlide and you're pretty good at it, you feel comfortable with that, but also if you have a training program and you've got fellows and you've got a bunch of partners who are doing it, uh, and you have somebody break one ProGlide and you don't have any ProGlides left, you get really distressed. So our modification, my modification to that is now we put two ProGlides in, waste a little bit of money, but we put them in at 12 o'clock. And what I'm just insurance. Uh, and, and as Samir said, we use Angel Steel. But this is certainly uh, changed uh, even a bigger depth of the access problems as we've gotten smaller. We're in Texas, so fracking is also new. Efficiency, uh, this is not all that new, but uh, the, mo the mantra to our anesthesiologists, we're done with three cases by noon and they're supposed to be on the golf course. We actually try to do four by 1.30. Um, same day discharge. Sounds a little crazy. It's all the things that Samir said. You don't want to diminish reimbursement, but that's not our, real, our, our biggest problem. Uh, and our biggest problem is that we know if we keep people in the hospital, we make them sick and we can even kill them if we try hard enough. So um, some of you have seen my video of a uh, World War II veteran, 88 years old, who had a case 11.30, went home at 5 o'clock. That was more of an accident because we didn't have any beds. However, we do now have a protocol. We have same-day discharge and we're looking at that. And the neuroprotection uh, uh, is clearly here. It's new uh, for us, and um, we're you know, part of a couple of the trials, so we're gonna see how that plays out, but it's new. So uh, this is gonna go quickly, but low risk, intermediate risk, high risk, perhaps. Uh, we've used Vino's slide that he extracted from the database with almost 150,000 patients multiple times. You've seen this, you know it, but you know, embedded in your head, is it 20% are high risk and intermediate risk? 80% uh, aren't, but high risk and intermediate risk and partner and sort of uh, and other things is really a pretty good settled science. Uh, with two cardiologists sitting up here, and uh, one cardiologist and one surgeon, the surgeon is uh, probably the biggest prototype. <laughs> you know, Mike, Mike's often debated me with, you know, l l this is Taver and uh, it's important and, and Mike's the prototype of that. So we know that there are plenty of these people you don't want to operate on. So where are we? Well, we're really in the low risk journey and we're waiting for this data, you know, the bill uh, and everybody talked about earlier. Uh, so if we look at this, it's really probably an unsettled science in low risk patients. And where are we? I'm gonna say this is a composite of some of the issues without getting too cute about technology and Zeltus that we'll mention as Mike uh, and others pointed out this morning. But neuroprotection, durability, leaflet immobility or valve thrombosis and perhaps the permanent pacemaker rate. Some others, vascular access, as we saw, is going away fundamentally. Coronary obstruction, you got a great lecture on that and the pieces and parts of it. Uh, and then uh, imaging, we'll just touch on that briefly. So neuroprotection, much of this you know. I mean, stroke rate from early days, from the most difficult patients, from literally inoperable patients who were done, who probably shouldn't have been done, and partner on into Sir Tavi. As we go down through intermediate risk and low risk, the rates continue to go down. Sentinel trial, you heard about it again already today. Uh, certainly the aspects of, well, you got a negative trial, not so fast because as pointed out, endpoints may not be right. And what do we know? We know that the devices were safe. There was a significant reduction in sort of mental state, cognitive delirium pieces, and there is a reduction in lesion volume. And we'll touch on that in a minute with a family tie. But whenever you take these devices out, we virtually always have something in there. You have to look hard sometimes, but there is debris in there, there's something in there. You can say, well, it's small, you know, I'll let that go to my brain. Probably not if it was your brain. Uh, CTNS, CTSN trial, same kind of thing. All these things are building data, and I think we're gonna see, as this accumulates over time, we're gonna see a lot of data moving towards neuroprotection is sort of the crucial element as the FDA has already recognized. A again, a trend and, and some data showing it. So will it become the standard of care? I think so, and we talk often about the fact that it may become the standard of care beyond TAVR and other surgical realms. 
Would you want it for your mother, father, grandmother, or yourself? Uh, Mike and I talk about this a lot. We spend a lifetime trying to figure out what to do to somebody based on what we would do to each other. And uh, we also always ask our hospital president, would he want one or does he just want us to uh, not pay for it? So this is what it's going to look like, right? In the black without neural protection right now, it will get reimbursed. What's uh, you know the add-on going to look like? Nobody knows, but I think you're going to see neural protection. Durability, again, uh, everybody touched on it early, early days, all the trials, out to five years, very durable no matter which measure you really use. Uh, partner, core valve, all the things. Uh, this is a partner trial, Mike, Marty, the entire partner gang. Um, we know that the outcomes go that way. No reoperation or structural valve deterioration, uh, you know, now well past five years. And uh, everybody's favorite, Mike's uh, Journal of Biomechanics that you study, uh, me measuring stress and strain. But what it shows on the left are different strains uh, on TAVR and SAVR valves. And fundamentally, what they said is the simulation suggests that the durability of TAVR valves may be less than SAVR, maybe down to under eight years. Uh, and then uh, the Stanford group uh, looked at mechanical versus biological, uh, looked at the probability of uh, mortality. Uh, in the uh, view of these different valves. And also on the right, you can see that fundamentally they've tried to answer the question of we, the debate of what age is the right age? Where do you switch? Where do you change? Where do you come down? And we've seen it happen from you know a good while ago, 70, 65, 60, um, into the 50s, and what's the right answer? Partner trial, along with all the other trials you saw this morning, we're seeing that everything is going to be followed through 10 years. So durability is going to be looked at, I think, in very good ways. And you're going to see, we've already seen extension of some of the five-year follow-ups to 10 years. It wouldn't be surprising to see some of the 10-year trials to get extended to 15 years or more. Valve thrombosis, you know, came on the scene. Raj did a great job of uh, the initial presentations and the awakening. Uh, again, all the work out of the Scandinavians and, you know, part of the whole partner group. Uh, Lastinger and Shuren certainly uh, reflected on it from the FDA, and then Mike and David um, wrote the very nice editorial uh, in the New England Journal. You've seen plenty of these pictures probably by now. We see them in all valves, core valve, portico, sapien, but also surgical valves. Uh, and you can see the accumulation. We have a phenomenal imaging specialist. He brings these pictures up to us so you can see virtually every aspect of it happening, 30 days post-TAVR, asymptomatic, a gradient change, but 12, not a 20, uh, and then post-Coumadin, we know that these things can generally be dissolved. SAVR, same thing, clot forming, uh, you know, affecting leaflet uh, function, and we see it across the board. When we look at it in TAVR, uh, a study showing at 7%, some have shown maybe above that, uh, what we've seen uh, in, in this, again, from uh, the resolve in savory investigators is it's more common in TAVR, 5 versus 13 percent perhaps. DAP doesn't work, anticoagulation does. Uh, there is an increased association with neuro events, uh, and this has the opportunity to improve things with treatment and prevention. So uh, permanent pacemaker rates imaging and new technology. We saw a little bit of new technology. I'm not going to really go into new technology because you know it's rapidly changing. Uh, no matter how young or old you are, if you uh, if you've been here paying attention for the past 5, 10, 15, 20, or 30 years, new technology has taken over just about everything. Um, per permanent pacemaker rates, all comers, you know, impacted by age. Don't forget who we started with in the very elderly. Average age in the first trial is 86. Risk scores, conduction system disease that they already had. Maybe we just forced them to expose that whenever we gave TAVR. So if you look at high risk or low risk only, does that start to change? Right now, uh, you know, there's a multiplicity of data, multiplicity of trials, multiplicity of different rates with different valves, but it looks like that, you know, probably uh, you could get everybody to agree that TAVR's above 10%, and then you can parse it out in those things, and that SAVR in good surgeons' hands should be 4%, 3%, maybe a little bit less. And, and where will the low-risk PPM rates settle out for TAVR? Uh, we think that they'll come down, but, uh, you know, the data's still out there. However, there are other things that are happening as well uh, on the technology side. You know the leadless pacemaker now, Micra, Nanostem. The companies are going to have leadless pacemakers. You don't have leads lying across the tricuspid valve. There's still going to be issues about long-term pacing in people who are younger, but these things are going to change with technology as well. 
Uh, and we're going to see a lot of things on the horizon for all these parts and pieces, whether it's vascular access, pacing, or the technology of the valves. Here is a leadless, non-cardiac, non-vascular pacer. Okay? So, you know, instead of getting a median sternotomy in your midline, you get a little nick that looks like a link, and you lay a pacemaker on top of your sternum. Some of these things may alter, you know, what happens as these things try to come together. Uh, imaging techniques, if you have a great imager like we do, 3D modeling, 4D CT, and some of the parts and pieces both for sizing, valve evaluation that we haven't even dreamed up yet. New technology, uh, as everybody touched on in various ways. Multiple valves and trials of element in six continents. I don't think there are any, any in Antarctica. Uh, multiple new design technologies and the new materials touched on uh, by a couple people, including my partner Mike, uh, ETR and Zeltis. So is this low risk TAVR? Probably not, but fundamentally the issue is Okay, on the left, neuroprotection fails, isn't reimbursed, TAVR durability doesn't work out, low risk patients on anticoagulation, how long, what happens, what are the complications of Coumadin et al. SAVR, TAVR pacemaker rates remain disparate, get more disparate, or neuroprotection works, gets paid for, TAVRs is durable, it lasts as long as SAVR, valve thrombosis, false alarm, SAVR and TAVR rates pacemaker wise, no difference, and Dr. Reardon finishes up on the way. Thank you very much.